Thank you for joining us at Lights, Camera, Diaspora. Um, we are uh, a skills development, training, sharing uh, organization, a not-for-profit based in Los Angeles. And our primary uh, work is to share the skills and opportunities and growth between the US and the African markets in the film industry and television. And uh, let's see, we are fortunate today. We'll go, let's see. Yolanda Okereke, say good morning. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yolanda is a costume designer based in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, I've had the pri privilege of working with her on Ghost in the House of Truth. Uh, she also did King of Boys and Wedding Party 1 and 2, which I think makes her the box office lead in Nigeria in costuming, if I dare say so myself. Uh, Merriman is a recent one as well, the setup. And we both were just on the Netflix uh, Nigeria project uh, that thanks to COVID is uh, yet to be completed. Yeah. Thank you, Yolanda, for joining us. Uh, Lahasa, good morning. Say hello, Lahasa. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. <laughs> yes. Lahasa is in Joburg. Lahasa is a three-time SAFTA nominee. Uh, Lahasa is known for Real Housewives of Johannesburg, MTV Sugar. He also worked on Queen Sono, Netflix's first original uh, production in Africa that I worked on as well with him. That's where we met. And he worked on The Wound. Would you say it in the traditional? Ingleba. Ingleba. I'm getting there. And we are <laughs> Lhasa, thank you. Uh, Mona Lisa, say hello. Good morning. Excellent. Mona Lisa is a producer for Lights, Camera, Diaspora and, is, and many, many other things to my production life. Uh, Mona Lisa will be organizing some things in just a moment. Uh, she has some housekeeping work to do with us as well. And Mona Lisa will be managing. Well, go ahead, Mona Lisa. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, just a couple of housekeeping stuff. We are, we, there is a Q and A, this is a webinar, not a meeting. So there is a Q and A section on the bottom of your screen. Um, so you can go ahead and put in any questions that you have on the Q and A box. Um, Christian will go ahead and read some of them and you can direct it directly to who you want to ask the question to so that Christian can direct the question to them. If we don't get to your question, which we might not, um, we'll try and answer them on the Q and A box so we will just type it in if we don't answer them live during the webinar. And also there is a chat box on the bottom as well. And that chat box we're going to go ahead and have, um, if, um, and all the attendees are gonna put in their um, social media handles on there. And if you have any comments, you can put it on there, but please put the questions on the Q&A box. Um, comments will go there and if they refer to any films or um, any websites or any equipment, I will go ahead and put the name of it for you on the chat box. So if you miss it during the, um, when they say it, don't worry about it, it's gonna be on the chat box. And that's about it and we are ready to start. Thank you for joining us. Excellent. And we're broadcasting live, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, we are. And we're also live on YouTube. Excellent. Thank you. And then we have uh, Ruth E. Carter. Say good luck, Ruth. Where are you? There you go. Uh, Ruth is a Hampton, College, Hampton University now graduate. She started out in theater and has opera training as well. Ah, Ruth's Films, for those of you who have not known the long list of things, just a few, uh, Clockers, Five Heartbeats, Love and Basketball, I'm going to get you sucker with the Goldfish Shoes, which we love, uh, Ruth's Television Reboot, Marshall, Sparkle, Tina Turner Story, Baby Boy, The Butler, Selma, Oscar nominated for Amistad, Oscar nominated for Malcolm X, and Oscar winner for Black Panther. And we are super excited to have Ruth Carter, Ruth E. Carter, 
So thank you very much, Ruth E. Carter, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know, it's been a, a thrill uh, right now after Black Panther was so well received across the world. Um, it, it, it became, you know, more than gratifying because of the hard work we put into it to tell an authentic story, um, to actually represent uh, the continent of Africa and the historic tribes and bring that home to the African-American diaspora and, you know, make that connection, I think a connection that's rarely, if ever made, and um, the validation that it gave uh, all of us to by the outpour of love for the film um, that we had done something good and we had changed the eye of beauty uh, and we had you know brought in uh, a, a lot of pride for ourselves but I feel like um, we've been trying to do that for a long time. You know, when I started working with Spike Lee in Brooklyn, New York at 40 Acres and a Mule, you know, our credo was uplift the race. And we were always trying to bring in, um, you know, the African diaspora in our work and um, the African American experience and our, tra and our journey in this country. It was always a part of what we were doing with uh, Do the Right Thing. Um, we had, it was a protest film, Do the Right Thing was. Right. Right. We had billboards that said Tawana Brawley trolled the truth and Mike Tyson, Brooklyn ah, Zone. I remember Mike that, Tyson. yeah. You know, we were, we were there. You know, when people say Do the Right Thing stood the test of time, um, that's what we set out to do. Uh, make a film that stood the test of time. You did so that. I have been very fortunate to have worked with some masters at uh, filmmaking, in, including uh, Mr. Epps here, Christian, who really do know their craft and know how to translate uh, thought and theory and ideas into storytelling through the, okay. through the medium of filmmaking. And that's 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 what I've been doing all of this time. Can I show them your demo reel of some of the stuff? Oh yeah, sure. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Thank you. 
demonstrate resist. They're gonna kill my children. That means march, that means disturb the peace. Yes. Да. Audio. All right. Everybody can hear? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. That is fantastic. Oh my God. <laughs> and then, and I know it's just a piece of what you've done. Just amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, in the spirit of collaboration, Yolanda, Lahasa, I think you guys should take it away. Yes, I mean, um, it, was, it was really amazing just watching the, um, the, um, the body of work that you have done through the years. And it's really aspiring for, for us to also, to also see that, that um, it comes from, a, like, you, you paved way for, for us as Africans to start telling the stories as authentic as we would want to, to tell our stories and not to be apologetic about telling our stories. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, I just feel that that should have come from, I mean, and this is also a question to, to you, Ruth, that um, what, like, what, what, like, how, 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 how inspired, like, how, how, how did you take inspiration from, 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 from your growing up and um, growing up in Massachusetts and going to Hampton, um, like what, what, what lessons did you learn that you have incorporated into some of the stories that had a lot of history about Africa that you, like, that, that you had to implement into, into the storylines? Yeah, so it's surprising that someone like me, right, has this passion to tell the stories of Africa, but I think that we all have a thirst to know where our origins are. And for me, as a young girl in Massachusetts, I was raised to celebrate Kwanzaa. Um, we actually lived in a community that celebrated Kwanzaa. And so there was always a uh, influx of uh, learning about um, you know, even though Kwanzaa is a made up holiday, it also does give you some roots and some um, fundamentals. So I learned Swahili uh, when I was very young and I couldn't speak it swa uh, fluently, but I knew Habaragani, Marhaba. I knew we would say hello and goodbye that way. And, um, you know, my older sister was very much about the Black Revolution. She was very much into the um, Black Power Movement. So we knew about, you know, the revolution will not be televised, the last poets. And so I was raised with a lot of rich, a richness about culture. I read uh, James Baldwin and Langston Hughes. I recited Sonia Sanchez and Ed Bullins. As a junior high school student, I was learning about all of these things. And so by the time I got to school, I already had like this rich foundation of culture that I wanted to continue with. Um, I started in special education because my parents came from education, but theater mm -hmm was where I found I could get a lot of culture um, out of. And um, I, I kept my feet in the theater department quite a bit. 
And through there, I went to Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia, and I started studying about the history of African Americans in this country through, um, through Williamsburg. I was assigned a historian that uh, helped me research real people that lived in Williamsburg, Virginia, that came uh, that came there from Africa and were maybe a second generation, and how they how they worked to buy their freedom in Virginia. And I played a, uh, a character on the Living History uh, in the Living History program there that I had to actually real research a real person two real people actually that I played every other day. So that further um, solidified my training as a historian in a lot of ways of, you know, culture. And it just continued to uh, become something that I wanted to build on. So after I graduated from school, um, I, I wanted to continue in theater and did internships and, and found costuming in college and all of that, but always had uh, a, a, a desire to work in black theater. I, um, I knew of Adolph Caesar and Denzel Washington working for the Negro Ensemble Company and doing a soldier story and I desperately wanted to become part of that ensemble. So there was a there was a uh, a base where I was studying costume design and I was doing a lot of that, but there was a continuation and undercurrent of cultural training that started when I was very young. Mm. Oh, that, that's really nice to hear. Um, you you mentioned something about your sister mm -hmm. and, and the um, the Black Revolution movement. Yes. So I'd like to ask you, how, what have you learned from the women in your family and how did that influence you? Did you get the support of family you needed when you needed to make the decision to transition from teaching? Because you mentioned yeah. that you started, you have a teaching background. So did you need that support from teaching to costume designing? Did that support matter? And I remember I read an interview where you said you, your mom has a sewing machine yes. and from time to time you would use the sewing machine, do some patchwork, so how yeah. does that support matter and the influence from the women in your family? Yes, thank you. I've had some incredible women uh, around me growing up. Um, I, we had a village. Um, when I um, speak of my sisters, there were two families that combined became my nucleus. And um, <clears throat> uh, my sisters were, were, one was Zakia Hakim. She had changed her name. She was the revolutionary. And um, she really did teach us, uh, you know, um, about, you know, just, you know, wholesomeness and, you know, eating right. And she was like the first person that I knew who was, you know, vegetarian and organic and all of that, you know, when I was young, it wasn't necessarily popular. But at the same time, my mother who was old school, grew up in the South, in the country, she was also very healthy, you know? So there was like this foundation of like, um, this grounding of being, you know, natural and, um, you know, natural hair and all of those like rooted fundamental things were enforced um, in my community of, of two families that raised me um, that were spearheaded by women. Um, and then uh, Sylvia, who um, also, you know, encouraged us, like they, they were Muslims, and so they encouraged us to study the Quran and to pray to the East and to, you know, understand the principles of, you know, living a good Muslim life. I went to a Muslim school uh, for a year. Mm -hmm. In, um, high school because I, I went there because you graduated early you know and I was really <laughs> interested in graduating early from high right. school right. Um, but the school was closed and I had to transition back to public school um, but I think the fundamentals that I got from the women in my life my mom who was a parapsychologist in, in our in our community she knew everybody like she knew everybody's issues like not only did she knew, know like 
the divorcee around the corner, the lady who like they divorced and uh, she knew all the issues, you know, <laughs> that they were having as a family, you know? And so, you wow. know, she was constantly, you know, we were her sounding boards, you know, we didn't love that, but she would, you know, express a lot of things to us that we found uncomfortable and embarrassing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, I feel like it, I gained a knowledge about people and their stories, you know, and that there aren't perfect people, you know. My mom was not invited to a lot of the, you know, uh, hoity-toity things, the Jack and Jill and the links, because she was also divorced, you know. You had to have a husband to be in those organizations. Right, right. But I remember her telling us all the time, you know, like, because she knew about people and she would say, you know, those things aren't important. And, um, you know, that, that really in, it influenced me. Um, but when I went to school, you know, I went with t-shirts and jeans and a 10 speed bike, even though I went to a school where it was very dark and lovely and you had to, you know, some kids were carrying a briefcase to class, you know, mm. and uh, I knew from my, the women in my life that to, you know, understand who I was and my art, and to pursue that was more important. Um, you know, it, it, it hurt me in some ways because it took me a long time to figure out how to get, how to do my hair, you know, but, right. uh, you know, because natural wasn't as popular as it is now where you can go on YouTube and figure out how to do the twist and all that kind of stuff. So it, it, it became a journey for me that I feel like was supported by the foundation that I got from some really, really beautiful women. And even when I went to school, my instructor, Linda Bolton Smith, who has, you know, dearly departed, but she was the one who actually really groomed me as an artist. She saw a couple of the plays that I'd done and she said to me, you know, you, you can do this. And to have someone say that to you, when you are forging your own path, it feels really validating. Mm. And, you know, the, so those like strong women who had a really strong sense of what they were pursuing for their lives were able to transfer like some of the things they saw in me. Nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so when, when in the way of village, uh, one of our village people, co-founder Lorna Johnson is on. I just want to say hello to Lorna and thank her for helping us end up here. But also in the way of village, there's a Beryl Bash, who I think you know. Beryl um, Bash, yes. yes oh. It's part mm -hmm. of your village. Uh, yeah. She's signed up. I'm not sure if she's here yet, but she's signed up as well. Oh, okay. So your oh, village yeah. is, is behind <laughs> you. Yeah, my <laughs> classmates. We were classmates at Hampton University uh, in nice. the theater department. Nice. Yeah, I was about to say it's 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 very important. I think it's very important to to have that background and to have the strong uh, support. And I mean, um, from my side, I I grew up also in a family of very strong women, strong African women. And back in the days, uh, back in the days of, of, of apartheid, they used to work in factories. They used to be uh, housemaids, and it was always amazing to see, to hear the stories and to see some of their pictures and how they used to um, how they used to dress and how they used to look and how they used to carry themselves with pride, but always yeah. remi 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 remembering to always instill in us our Africanism and and where we come from and always reminding us of who we are as Africans. And I mean, like with that said, also it is very important to have some sort of knowledge about the industry that you are you are coming into and what you want and what message you actually want to want, want to put out when 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 in the industry because there's a lot of things that um that that are motivating the the storytelling but then as as us as costume designers to tell the stories as authentic and as real as we we, we have to tell them and i think that in, 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 in many instances that um, cultural appropriation is, has, has, because has become such a thing that we, we always have to be aware of stuff that we put out 
even before we uh, even before we start discussing them with with other people either in productions or just in, in in our circles and it's very important for us to understand what we want to communicate to the world because we are given that platform to tell our stories and to tell our stories from the backgrounds and not knowing who is telling the story and with that said what 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 was your challenges that you faced i mean you I know that you had to travel to to Africa to 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 a couple of countries to get permission for some of the garments and uh, prints that you used for for Black Panther. What were the challenges that were faced, and how did you go about tackling them? And yeah, and 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 what and what were the processes in in in, in you doing that? Yeah, I think though that we we tr we an initially um, were uh, using I think about fifteen different cultural tribes that were uh, from uh, from regions all over the continent. So if I were to do that research there, I'd still be there. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I actually went to the history books because as we all know, and some people did not know, um, that Africa is a very modern place. In many areas, they're still very cultural, and, and, but most of the people have moved into the city. You know, there's some people in the country, like the Himba, uh, that still practice a lot of their cultural uh, uh, practices, but most, for the most part, it's a modern place. So I didn't expect to find that in Africa. I actually went after I finished Black Panther because I had done so much research about the different areas that when I decided to take a vacation, I said, that's where I need to go because mm -hmm. you know I know now where to go. And so I went to Joburg, I went to Afropunk Joburg, and I went to uh, Cape Town and I uh, went up into the bush. Um, and I had an amazing time. It was a vacation. <clears throat> My research was done through some an incredible compilations. Uh, one was called African Ceremonies and and I also had shoppers. I had uh, shoppers in Nigeria, I had shoppers uh, in South Africa that um, traveled around because I wanted to find authentic pieces to draw my uh, inspiration from. I didn't mm -hmm. want to use uh, made in China pieces to create the, the materials that we would use for like say the Dora Milaje. And um, I fell in love with a lot of things. I fell in love with the Dogon. I fell in love with the uh, Himba. I fell in love with the Turkana and I desired greatly to recreate some authentic traditional garb and I only had the opportunity to show it in its purest form at the Warrior Falls and when T'Challa makes his ascension and he sees his father and, his, and he tells his father, I'm not ready. And what's surrounding them, which I wish that the camera had actually really laid eyes on what the people who were surrounding them in that scene, you know, when he wakes up and he sees his yeah. father, his father is a panther in the tree and he, uh, and he uh, creates himself in human form. The people in that scene were dressed so beautifully in their traditional garb. And a lot of those pieces actually did come from the shoppers I had uh, 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 curating and collecting for me in Africa. Um, I had the Ishikolo, a huge, beautiful one on one woman, you know, I had the main of the headdress, you know, of a Maasai on another. It was just glorious. And the camera had to stay on T'Challa and the father. Right. So it, uh, but it was the first time that we actually showed tradition, uh, traditional dress in our shooting schedule. So it was very important for me to get the ball rolling, you know, uh, with that. Um, but everywhere else in this, this superhero model, I had to infuse African, tra African traditional garb. 
So uh, the Dora Milaje have a, have a harness that is made out of leather and hammered um, with trinkets and shapes. Um, and I got the actual pattern of the leather from working on roots where we had South African leathersmiths making us these wraps and these belts that had amber pieces on mm. and they were roped and tied and, and sewn. And I brought that into the shop here in Los Angeles and said, this is how their harness that wraps their body, this is how it needs to look. This is how it should be made. Because everybody wanted to tell me uh, at first, this is how we do it at Marvel. You know, this is how we do it. And yeah, yeah. You know, I had to say, you know, look guys, this is not the Lion King. And, <laughs> and this is not coming to America. <laughs> Right. This is Black Panther, and I have a responsibility to be as authentic as I can. And that that desire to be authentic came from my childhood. Mm -hmm. So I knew, I knew what was ex what was expected of me, and when I was shown something that was inauthentic. It, it made me, I, I, my stomach, I, I, I welled up. I had tears. I couldn't take it. So I had to find and dig and really communicate to everyone. This is what we're doing. We're, we're crafting a world that is based on truth and based on real cultural tribal technique. Wow. Wow. And your background as a child you spoke of earlier, helps to motivate that from the very beginning. That's great. That, yeah, we, that, were, we were serious about, you know, the revolution will not be televised. <laughs> 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 right. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, that's Indeed. True. That's, so, that's so great to hear because most people don't realize the amount of work that has to go and the amount of you as a person, your, the essence that makes you who you are, that goes into your work. So it's really amazing to hear that. Um, you have a really good working relationship with Spike Lee. Mm -hmm. You guys have a long history of collaborating, working together on over eight movies, I'm sure. Eight movies yeah. am I right? Yeah. So I how that. I think it's more like 12 and that doesn't count like photo shoots and yeah. pilots and TV mm -hmm. stuff. We've been in each other's lives for 25 years. Oh, Maybe wow. More than that now. I, I think more, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's I, so I've, I've been there 30 and you were there before I got there. Yeah, so 35. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm such a big <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So how did this relationship with Spike Lee, how did it begin? How has the collaboration evolved from the beginning to now? And yeah. what is that? Because from what you just said, um, over 12, 12 movies, that, that means there's a relationship between you and this person, a really good working relationship. So what is the perfect cocktail for a director, costume designer relationship? Because mm -hmm. I know sometimes your, your visions differ. So yeah, and, you, and, and even with Spike, um, you know, he has a very particular vision that it takes like listening and like following that and trust and following that vision. And um, I, over the years, it, it, it kind of develops. Uh, in the beginning, um, I met Spec, Spike out here in Los Angeles. I was uh, a costume designer. Uh, apprentice. I was working at a theater called LA Theater Center. And um, in my off time, I was actually freelance designing and I was doing a dance show called Otis Salid's Night for Dancing. And it was, yeah. um, yes. At Shout Louisville. out to Otis. And, yeah, Otis. And um, it was uh, being performed at the Lula Washington Dance uh, Studio, which was in a really small, not like where it is now, it's very mm -hmm. shiny, big and new. But then it was a little tiny dance studio in South Central. And uh, the dance show became so popular that people in the television industry, movie industry, they were, you know, the town cars would line the street to go see this show. And I was working at the LA Theater Center as the shop foreman. 
uh, which was way beyond my skill set, but I talked my way into that job and I had access to stock. And so I, I actually designed through their stock and designed a night for dancing and Spike came to see it. Uh, I was talking to a friend who was also there about, I was trying to break into costume design out in the world, not in film, in theater. And LA don't, doesn't have a lot of theater. Uh, <laughs> right. And she was trying to give me advice and Spike was there. He had just did She's Gotta Have It. He wasn't a known director. He was the independent director who had one film that he had or two. He had John Joe's Bedside Barbershop and he had done She's Gotta Have It. And he was there with my friend Robbie Reed and she introduced us. Then afterwards, we all went out to party and Spike kept, you know, dancing, asking me to dance. And I was like, oh, this guy likes me, you know? What is his problem? Uh, and he was just really trying to tell me how to get more film experience. And he told me to go to USC or UCLA and sign up to uh, be involved with their, their film students and their senior thesis projects. He said they, they work with the same equipment that the big movies do. You'll learn how to work on a set. And so I did, and I signed up at USC. I was, before I knew it, on the weekends, I was doing a, a student thesis project, a uh, senior thesis project. And um, then he called me one day, one morning really early, he called me and, you know, he asked me to do school days and that started the whole ball rolling. Nice. No, that's so, that's so great. So what kind of relationship, did, when did you guys have, did you guys have a butt head on any project? Yeah, we did all the time. We're like brother and sister that kind of butt heads and, and uh, you know, have a difference, not necessarily a difference of opinion because his opinion overrides all opinions. Yeah. But maybe because Spike likes to be very much immersed in the process that I have to cool his jets about things that are coming that may not be here yet, you know? Uh, so, <laughs> so I'm always like uh, calming and he, even though he's passionate and big, I'm always trying to make myself the, you know, the cool to the hot. And, um, and it's worked, uh, it's worked, um, it's helped um, that, you know, uh, I'm not fearful of a passionate director, that I can still communicate through, you know, things not necessarily moving smoothly because we know in our process, you know, stuff yeah. happens, you know, mm -hmm. and so you have to kind of explain why I need an extra hour or two or why, you know, uh, you know, something doesn't work. So there's, there's that, uh, that's helped our relationship a lot that I'm, 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 I'm able to articulate, I guess, to someone who's kind of, you know, hot under the collar. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yes, well, I, th I, th I think it's beautiful what you said about how you, uh, your journey into getting into costume, because a lot of people just think that they see you now as a successful costume, uh, costume designer, and they think that you just started by doing amazing films and you're just winning or, or, or getting nominated, and yeah. they never understand the process of actually... Yeah, the, the process of actually getting to, getting, getting to become a costume designer. You have to start from the bottom and... Sometimes the bottom is is not as low as other people other people have started, but everybody has their own story to tell, and everybody has their own journey to tell. And I think it's very important for anybody who wants to come into uh, into coming becoming a costume designer to first understand why they're coming into it and what they actually want to do in 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 costume because that also will then motivate you in 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 the other processes that you will that 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 you will have to go through the, in becoming a costume designer and i mean now you are an academy winner <laughs> and a first also so it, it's also also inspiring some of us who are coming up and who are 
striving in, in, in Africa to see that, listen, it's just putting in the work and putting in the hours and one day somebody will see and, and, the, and, and your peers will actually um, salute you in the work that you do. And congratulations on your, on, on, on your Oscar win. And how can you say the previous nominations then inspired you to, to, to get you to, to, actually in, to, to actually eventually winning an Oscar? Like, have you learned something from the previous nominations where, I mean, like, with, with Amistad and, uh, and Malcolm X, where, did, you, did, did you take some inspiration from that to say, okay, I, I probably lagged in this, in this section and probably this is where I need to improve. So what would you say uh, were, were the improvements that you had to make in, in, in Black Panther and evolving from, 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 the, from the previous projects? Well, one thing is for sure, have you noticed that there are certain designers that are nominated almost every year? Mm -hmm. And my nominations were about 10 years apart. And I think between Amistad and uh, Black Panther, there might've been about 20 years. So um, what one thing takeaway is that uh, the journey for you as a black person, as an African person, is not going to be the same as some of your counterparts. And that is because the opportunities are different. And when you recognize that you are an artist and that you can um, practice your art through uh, these, the medium of film or television or theater, and you seek your rewards differently because mm -hmm. you're not measuring your success by uh, reaching the Dolby stage. You're, you're yeah. finding that you're on this journey um, for lots of other good reasons. And um, one of the things that I learned every step of the way was what worked and what didn't work. And mm -hmm. what do I need to learn uh, for the next one? So from uh, Malcolm X, it was always research was what worked. Um, and so I also observed like color theory this is something I need to learn a lot more about and value. Um, you know, a lot of times we don't understand value and how value is sometimes more important than color because after we understand value and light and dark, we can infuse color. And so mm -hmm. those practices of, you know, understanding your art like an artist is what I took from one project to the next. And then when I went from Malcolm X to Amistad, I said, wow, I can't really rely on uh, the pho photographs because photographs didn't exist during this mm. time. Now I have to go to art history and discover the artists of the time and their mm. rendering and their composition and, uh, and see how they painted blacks in art. So I have a two, uh, two uh, a, a volume set of blacks in art and I can like look at the details. And then when I got to, you know, Roots, which was also Emmy nominated, I had to understand about how, you know, to read. The, so I understand what I'm looking at. You know, so from one journey to the next, there's like this exciting, like discovery of what worked and what didn't work. And, and I actually find the reward in that because it actually makes me better each time I came back to it. So by the time I got to Black Panther, I was so ready. I was so ready to infuse color theory and values and research and implementation. I had the skill set to uh, from from all those all of those films to bring to the implement implementation of the costumes for Black Panther. Nice. Uh, value. Could you give us a one se a one sentence on that for those who don't know in our audience? Uh, value is like the grayscale. Like if you can squint and see where light is on a face, if you can squint and see how pattern works together, 
um, those and, and how composition is in the room with the person. Um, it's important that we learn how to like uh, highlight our characters, separate them from our background and, and work in a way where there's a relationship between two characters. So when we're creating costumes, we're thinking in terms of lightness and darkness and richness, depending on the mood, because color, color can control your emotions. Color can mm -hmm. make you happy, color can make you sick, color can make you, you elated. And so we are, we are colorists in that way and texture you know, has a lot to do with, you know, the value and how light hits texture and creates a mood. So that's kind of the way as a costume designer, we look at the, the, the use of value. Um, and also for a DP like Christian who wants to, to light a scene, you know, they, they need to see what you have done and not have something in the background overshadowing the something in the foreground or something that shouldn't be bright in the foreground overshadowing the focus or the focal point so you know i look back at what i've done and try to understand what worked and really like find joy and pride in that because some of it is instinctual you know you mm -hmm. you can read you can go to class you can study but some of it's going to be instinctual and and the instinctual times that you have when something worked and you didn't even know it was going to work you know, <laughs> right. like, yes you know yeah. <laughs> Yeah, nice. that's so that's that's so that's so great to hear. That's so sweet to hear. What you just said is that costume designers are storytellers, and it's our it's our duty to tell the mm -hmm. truth when you're telling stories. So I just mm -hmm. want to know: Do you have an archive of books, magazines, research materials? Do you have those? How do you research for period films, contemporary films, and which one do you prefer? Because oh, when you do period. I I love them both. Like I, I look at Alexander McQueen and I look at Stella McCartney and I look at the row and I, I, I go, I, you know, I have an illustrator, lots of illustrators that I work with, but you know, one in particular, we're like pals and we'll walk to the Prada store and we'll go, let's see how Prada did it. You know, oh my yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. you know, and yeah. so we have fun just like, you know, seeing, artistry i mean because if we look at clothing as artistry contemporary and period they all are they are all are equal in many ways when you look at them as a work of art it's body art it's it's the you know wearable art and they even the contemporary borrow from the the period so i do the same thing I look at when I'm doing something modern, I look at period. When I'm doing something period, I look at modern because mm, there really. are always those anachronisms. I try to infuse it in a period way, like, wow, the stitching on those pockets looks like, you know, something from the 1940s on that suit. I'll look at that from the 1940s and say, hey, let's do that same similar style here because people are actually already um you know being introduced to it from versace mm -hmm. but it's actually mm -hmm. a period idea so let's do it in its true form in a period film and it will be received so i research everything i research period i research contemporary they both are to me um you know journeys explorations you know, uh, I want to see the origin of things. I want to see how they came up with their ideas. You know, not everything is so futuristic. Most things are based on something from the past. And I'm always interested in finding that, you know, finding that. And, and um, the other big, I think, uh, obvious thing about contemporary and period is that you know what they always say everybody has an opinion about uh, contemporary because they dress themselves every day and mm. with period but the other thing is with period you have like a vast landscape with which to work from 
Because when you do the work, you find that, well, so people don't throw things away. So you I, have, you can bring in the forties in your fifties piece, you know, <laughs> and you can age it down. There's like, there's so, there's like this range that you have to tell the story because you can find an old person in something from the twenties that they just kept and, and, it, and, and, you know, and age it down and stuff. And then you can have a contemporary woman, like, you know, feeling a little fashion forward. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not as forgiving when you do contemporary to actually do that. When you are doing something contemporary, you can't really bring in, you can, but it, it takes a lot of convincing of the actress that you're not trying to make her look like a character, that she, you know, this idea that you have is not so out there, you know, you're not trying to make her look like a 1920s flapper girl, you know, it's like uh -huh. you have to do a lot of uh, adjustments Adjusting to this contemporary brain that everybody's living in to accept a out there idea. So you really are more in contemporary times when you're doing a modern and you find that your characters do come from like real people on the street, you know, real everyday people on the street or real fashionistas, you know, in, 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 in life. Wow. So much. Everything is just amazing, and it's just like it's, it's just like a world of knowledge that that, that we're getting right now. Um, so you 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 spoke about uh, working with like illustrators on 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 most of your on most of your shows. Um, how imp how big is your teams on on when working with uh, when working on on period pieces? And also, do you normally work with the same team or? You do frequent from 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 team from from teams. Mm -hmm. Well, you know the the illustrators they work for a very short period of time on your production, so they have to go from production to production to production. And mm -hmm. uh, on Black Panther, I have a, I had a team of five illustrators. Uh, Marvel has a visual development department of illustrators, so everybody is drawing the characters. And then we came together and had these big meetings where all the illustrations are presented to Ryan Coogler and Kevin Feige and Victoria Alonso, the heads of Marvel. And we're discussing them and we're looking at the elements that we like and we're taking notes and we go back and we retool, everybody retools and brings them back to the table. And uh, you know, that's the level of collaboration that it took to make a film like Black Panther. And I took that that knowledge of collaboration because I'd never collab collaborated on that level before like that. We were meeting two and three times a week. I was like, how do they expect me to do my job if I have to go to another meeting? Yeah. But you know, that's why you have such a wide support around you. People who are looking at your boards. I did, you know, lots of boards and I have sticky notes on things and they're constantly coming out and grabbing information and putting together some of the ideas that you have while you're discussing ideas that have been pushed through. Um, that's the Marvel way. Then there is the normal way. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, on period pieces, a lot of times it's me doing mood boards and going into beautiful research and coming up with these, uh, I do electronic boards so I can send them out to the world. And then I do physical boards. I put boards in the hallway of the production office so people who are working around can see what each character is going to look like. And mm -hmm. so I share a lot of uh, information. Yeah, so people um, like me need that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so when you're coming in, you don't have time to sit down with me and have a meeting, it's not like there's a blank slate everywhere. There's mm. there illustrations lining the hallways, not illustrations, but research. Um, and then when I do get an illustrator on some, uh, some shows, I find that <clears throat> sometimes spending too much time with an illustrator wastes a lot of good time when you can be really looking for the perfect pieces 
Mm. Because we are coming from different budgets and different timelines on these uh, on these uh, projects. So to give yourself to an illustrator for two weeks or even five days when you only have six weeks to prep the job, you know, sometimes, you know, it, it, if your director needs that much you know, information that we got to draw these images. It, it, to me, it doesn't allow you to flourish in a world that if you're not doing the illustration, then you need to be discovering other kinds of ways that you mm. can enhance the storytelling. So mm. I, I let the illustrators come in, I give them, things that I'm looking for, and then I'm doing other things. I'm looking on the internet. I'm researching where I'm going to buy stuff. I'm looking at other designers that are offering things for sale. I'm looking at other craft people where I can have special jewelry pieces made. I'm not going to be able to think of all of that stuff and give it to an illustrator to draw. And, and it, it, it's nice to have illustrations so that at the end, you have this piece of art that you can show and say, this represents me and this film. But usually what you end up producing at the end of that illustration is not anything like the illustration. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I, and then I, how, how big are these things? Oh, so it's one illustrator. It's one illustrator. No, no, no. Uh, you mean my whole crew? Your whole crew. Your whole oh, crew. Okay, sorry, I got off on a tangent. There. <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, on Black Panther, I had a crew uh, that was Los Angeles and Atlanta based. I also talked about uh, Africa. So in totality, it was about forty people. Um, Ten here in Los Angeles, a couple in Africa and about 35 in uh, Atlanta doing different things. Set. We also built a, a jewelry studio where we made the Dora Milaje prototypes and then right across from uh, the jewelry studio was a mold making studio where once the prototype was made, they made a mold of it and then we pulled the same exact thing out of rubber for all the other Dora Milaje because they were all stunt women. So uh, mm -hmm. my crew was, my, uh, my constant everyday crew was large, but we also had different companies around Los Angeles and Atlanta doing specific things for us. So it was an enormous crew if you count all of those people. But in mm -hmm. general, I um, just did Coming to America, which we did outsource to 3D printers and model makers and all that kind of stuff. But my core is I had uh, two assistant designers, a supervisor, um, lots of PAs, uh, shoppers. Um, we usually have a supervisor who manages everyone and make sure the budget's turned in and does all of that, all of that work, you know, and budgeting and, mm -hmm. and crafting and making sure that, you know, invoices come in on time when they're supposed to and their amount of money that's supposed, that's a full-time job. Yes. You know, and I fortunately found someone who actually like likes doing it, you know, likes that mm -hmm. management. So usually that manager does hire a core for herself. My two assistants, they hire a core for them because everybody needs to be supported. Yeah. Oh, that, that's, that so great. that's so great. So I'm, I'm going to take you back to the period pieces, the period movie, sorry. Um, Malcolm X and Selma. These are two movies about two prominent African men so how were you able to what what did you do different in malcolm x from selma and how did you help them embody that character because this is they're not fictional characters these are real they're playing real people so how yeah. were you able to do that through your costuming well you know malcolm x if you can imagine you were young you are enthused you are wanting a perfect storm um, you are delving into the research, you are reading, your mind is sharp and wide open like a sponge. 
you want to extrapolate everything that you've learned from research and put it into action. And everywhere you look is some inspiration to accomplishing this goal. And as a young costume designer, that's where my headspace was with Malcolm X. I had read Alex Haley's book two or three times, and we all had a passion to bring such a special story to life like it had never been done before. And the only leader that we had in this scenario in this perfect storm was Spike Lee. So there was this freedom to create this world for yourself as a costume designer for Malcolm X because we didn't have a studio looking over our shoulder and saying, you don't do this and you don't do that. So at the time, Spike was building on 40 acres and he had bought a building that had four floors. It was actually one of those buildings that you can drive into and park your car and a big freight elevator mm. takes your car up to the third or the second floor and parks it there for you for the whole day. An attendant brings your car down in an elevator, a huge elevator that, you know, anyway, he had bought this building that used to be a car parking lot, but on the outside, the facade was just a regular brick building. And one of his, um, I'll try to make this story short. Um, <laughs> so I was made aware of this building when I saw it, I immediately knew that it was the perfect place to house all the costumes for Malcolm X. And so I went about crafting each floor to be a different period. So at the very bottom floor was the hmm. 20s. At the middle was the 30s. At the next level was all 1940s. At the very top was 50s and 60s. And that traveled us all the way through Malcolm X's life. And I, I, I accumulated all of this stuff by going and having things pulled from Los Angeles and all over. Uh, I even went to Chicago where a guy called me and said, you know, I have a warehouse of coats from the 1940s and 50s. You can come here and I'll give you whatever you want for $5 each. And I went there and there were piles of coats that I just put in separate piles and bought all of this great, great, great stuff. So, you know, as a young person, you know, crafting a film of that size, you're totally immersed in the experience of bringing this man's life to the, the film, to life, actually, you know, presenting him you know, as a full person, you know, we using the book, but also, you know, understanding the journey of a Muslim. I remember I had that journey in my life. <laughs> right. and I understood the principles of being a Muslim, a Muslim woman in the nation of Islam. So I was, uh, I was very much uh, uh, interested in showing uh, its goodness, you know, and not showing it as some kind of a sect, you know. And so I worked with the Nation of Islam to build the FOI, to build the, the, the dress for the women. And we amassed this department store basically of Malcolm X and when you showed up to be fit you went um, and you reported to a different floor depending on what scene that you were in so it, it's an experience like that that is priceless that you will never have it again really is. And to get an opportunity like that and to immerse yourself in the art um, and be able to be supported is beyond um, going into Mal uh, Amistad, it's a Steven Spielberg project, you know, mm -hmm. and my first day with meeting still Steven Spielberg, I was not given the script. I went and got cliff notes of the Amistad revolt and I read the cliff notes and I found the book and I went there with the, my meeting with the book. And I sat across from uh, Steven in a big meeting room and he said, you know, I love what you did on Malcolm X. So uh, that kind of was, you know, really wonderful to hear because I felt, well, they're here again. I'm going to be able to sort of, you know, use what I know. And, mm -hmm. um, and like I said, I used the art history to kind of guide my way through the, that story. 
I hope I answered your question because I kind of forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what, what did you do different on Selma? Because now oh, that's like... Yeah, Selma. Selma, Selma was hard because it was so hot. It was, it, we were doing a story that took place in the fall where people wore coats and they wore trench coats, you know, to show nonviolence. They wore their, they had their pockets, their hands in their pockets to as a sign of nonviolence when they marched. A lot of times they kept their hands in their pockets and it was 90 to 100 degrees in the day. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> and we were running around with piles of coats and that includes me. And <laughs> the idea of, uh, of the whole thing was to um, actually show Martin Luther King and in David Ayelowo and and actually show show like the reverence of the family, the church, and the civil rights movement. And in one, some ways, we I I I try to employ different techniques with like David Ayello's collar. I made it slightly tighter so he would have that same. Uh, fleshy overhang that King had with mm. his shirt collar. Um, and, you know, I walked around with a research. Uh, when we set up the uh, march for the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you know, once everybody was in line and once they added their coats because we were about to march, I was talking to them and saying, you know, this is who you are in this picture right here. You know, that guy with the cap, you have the same cap. This is who you are in this picture. I told them that sometimes in the fittings too, but I was mm. always rearranging people. I was taking over the AD's job because I had dressed specific people for specific reasons. Yeah. And I needed to see that in the march. I didn't want it buried somewhere in the middle of the crowd. I, I actually kind of moved people around. And, you know, Ava DuVernay is an amazing creative uh, soul. Um, you know, her spirit is big and, you know, I enjoyed sort of the, the, the process of understanding what her vision was and bringing to the table my best. And I did that every day, you know, in, in heat, you know, even our costume department had no uh, AC. So we were dressing people constantly, constantly. And that film was, was you know, one of those films I feel like, like Malcolm X and like Amistad and like Black Panther, that you're only going to see that once in your career. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Uh, just now we've got probably 20, 25 minutes on the official calendar. So I'll start okay. trying to throw in <laughs> Q and A's as well. All you right. keep going? Oh yeah. So I so for me, um, I just also wanted to find out. So then, what's the pre-production uh, process in in doing such big productions? I mean, just in comparison to like, I mean, like Black Panther has its own pre-production. I know because it's, it's it, there was a lot of planning that had to be done in comparison mm -hmm. to the to the period stuff. So what 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 are the pre, like what what are the time time periods given to 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 such um, projects? Well, you know, I always feel like I can morph to whatever we have, the timeline that we have. You know, I'm always using the shooting schedule as a part of my prep, too. Mm -hmm. so if something doesn't work for two weeks into the schedule, not only do I have the six weeks of pre-production, but I also have that little bit of two weeks in there to use. And that, that helps when you have specialized things being made, you have people sewing and building things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, prep, you know, prep on bigger films is what, 12 weeks, sometimes uh, less, sometimes a tiny bit more, never really much more than that. That's three months. Um, if you're lucky, you can get a sneak peek at the script and you can do some of your own work in terms of thoughts and ideas that you want to do. But in terms of hiring people and actually having a crew on and pre-production, it's a very finite amount of time. Um, and then um, on smaller films, it's a smaller amount of time where, you know, um, sometimes it's, see, it feels like it's impossible, like to even because they don't give you cast until two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so, then, 
It doesn't matter if you had 12, you're not going to even know who you're discussing <laughs> until two weeks ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's really hard. I mean, that really, you know, you have to do the prep because you have to know this stuff. You have to know this story and you got to know these characters. So when an uh, actor comes in and it's not what you expected, uh, you got to know how to be able to transition and, and mm. morph uh, to make it happen. So that, that is, you know, really to me, the, the true grit of pre-production, what are you going to do when the actors show up? And you're not going to be blank when they show up, you're going to be ready. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes when they show up, it's a flurry and it's, you know, uh, I always say, don't give me, I can't even do two people at once. Don't even give me two people. Don't, you know, the 80s when I'm going to send everybody to you at five o'clock. <laughs> no, it doesn't work like that. No. All, I don't want people outside the fitting room waiting. <laughs> exactly. exactly. What do you think? I'm, what do you think I am? What do you think this is? So, you know, sometimes we have to be firm and we have to let, you know, if something is going to take us a little bit longer, we've got to let people know what our process is in, you know, dressing these actors. Because I, I sometimes feel like casting, you know, they're so far removed from our process. They're in another yeah. building, they're in another office, they're in another city. And I keep saying, do they think they have till the camera rolls to cast these <laughs> Do you think they really have to the camera rolls? Because I want to call uh, them up and say, honey child, we <laughs> need him yesterday. I've got the same problem. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That is such a problem in costuming. Like people don't really understand. It's like I re I really thought that it, it was it was it was only here at back like back at home. But I guess it's, it's, it's just a general no. it's a general thing that we're we all at home. <laughs> Yes. So now you saying that now it, I'm trying to wonder like because one of my best scenes in Black Panther is the warrior fall. Yes. It was so beautiful to watch the range of African traditions, the different tribes in Wakanda. Uh, <laughs> How were amazing. you able to guide your team and also head the aesthetics and also get everybody? dressed for that scene and there was something really remarkable in the scene everybody had the kamoyo beads which yeah. I think was communication yes african tradition infused with modern technology that's mm -hmm. what that just said how were you able to how were you able to do that because that was so magical listen you're going to come to a place in your career where you know something so well that anything that's out of place, you're gonna climb over your car to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what the Warrior Falls was for me. I was in there wrapping turbans for for the Turkan. I was wrapping turbans for the Merchant Tribe, which was based on the the um, Lusu uh, not the Lusutu, based on the uh, Mali Tribe of Turkana. I can't uh, think of it right that now, but you know, I knew so much and I was there at daybreak when the atmosphere was coming in because Ryan Coogler uh, told me this is the one time where everyone wears their tradition to this, this ceremonial occasion, you know, the, the King's Ascension and, um, and the King's Challenge. And so I was excited. And he said, this should be, this should be like a feast for the eyes. Mm -hmm. So I was super excited. And I divided in the workshop all of the racks by color because there were color codes to each tribe. So everything was very organized. But I was so hands-on because I knew it so well. And you need so many people to help you manage a big scene like that. You can't teach everybody how to tie that turban, you know, or you can't teach everyone how to stack those beads. It's, it's actually something that you learn as you do it often. And we shot that towards the end of the schedule. So I was in there actually helping makeup and hair, you know, guiding them and making sure everyone had the look that I saw when I looked at the research. Nice. It was important mm -hmm. 
it was important. I mean, I was climbing up them rocks and they were like, Ruth, we're about to turn the water on. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I enjoyed that so much and I appreciate you saying that. It was, it was truly like, you know, once everyone was dressed, um, even Zuri, uh, you know, as the priest and he was in water, you know, he has had big water boots on under that big purple um, caftan, but, but making that thing, once it was illustrated, you know, even the craftspeople were looking at it like, what am I looking at? And so I had to be in the workshop, mm. you know, helping them to see it, you know, to see how the layers were, were to go, you know, on that big caftan that I actually based it on other things that were real African pieces from different places around Africa, but that's a whole nother story. And then there was a language to everything. Um, so, uh, and you know, I mean, it just was never ending. So, uh, so your cortisol level is way out of <laughs> uh, uh, but you survived it. But one of the Q and A oh. questions is okay. where do where do all those parts go to? Yeah. Oh, Marvel, this, Marvel has a warehouse. They have and, a, they keep everything. Is that, is that always the case on your films in general? Do you feel like you ever collect things or do the actors? Oh, I have a collection. I have an exhibition that I'm mounting of my work over the years, uh, 30 years I've collected because, you know, I come from theater. And yes. in theater, people collect, they save things because they may yes. need it for the next show. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> When I was at 40 Acres all those years, at the end, they were like, you know, oh, we're donating a portion to the church. And, and then sometimes I would put away stuff like in the basement at 40 Acres, hoping that it would be there when I came back, if I came back, right. and it wouldn't be there. And I go like, oh, what happened? And I asked some of the full-time employees, like, what happened to the stuff I stored downstairs for school days? And I was like, I got rid of that, you know? And I'm like, oh, so the next film, I was like, okay, so the zoot suits, like the, the things from Do the Right Thing, like, you know, these are precious things that I had created that I just didn't want to disappear and yeah. nobody cared about them. And so through the years, I was able to kind of amass a bit of a collection that, you know, it's a ball of wax for me now, you know, legally, I have to get permission from everybody to have it, you know, to, to, yeah. to not necessarily have it, but to have it borrowed. Yeah, yeah, to reuse it. Yeah. Wow. So much. It's a lot. I have a, I have a real career. <laughs> you do. You do. Um, let me ask, what is, what is your relationship to mentoring in terms of, do you, did you have a mentor? Uh, do you have mentors at this elevated phase in the industry? I feel like my mentors were the people who brought me into the industry and they, they believed in me as a costume designer. It wasn't another costume designer bringing me in. It was like Spike who took me shopping and said, you need three of these because we're going to have a stunt or you need six of them because we're going to have a water scene. Or, and I feel like those kinds of experiences I've had as a costume designer with people who brought me into the fold of filmmaking also gave me some mentorship and knowing that I was, I was uh, someone that they, they believed in and wanted there, but was new at it. Um, I, I came in the industry when there, there was less than a handful of people like me uh, doing this. Um, and so I would study the work of other designers, Anne Roth being one of them. I still think mm. she's masterful. And I would look at her films. I looked at Places of the Heart where she uses blue and brown so much in the composition of her work. Um, you know, artists make uh, strings, you know, they're, they're uh, in the color palette. They start with a combination of say, you know, blue and green to make this kind of a brown. And then they add white to it to give us different levels of that same color. Mm -hmm. And um, Anne Roth was doing that in the film. And I remember studying her ability to create these strings of the same color, but actually give it depth. And mm -hmm. I thought that was amazing. And I tried to do that on this little independent film. I, I was doing blue and brown on everything, but I didn't realize she had the budget to have things dyed and, 
have uh, things. So I remember the DP saying, you know, can you bring something to set that isn't blue or brown? And I was like, ah, he doesn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I, those were kind of like, I, I sought m out mentorship by choosing the people who I wanted to uh, be like, you know, it's like, anything you choose the artist that that inspires you and you try to do it the way that they do it and then through that process you learn something about yourself so in, in that sense it's okay to copy because you're not actually copying you're really learning mm -hmm. and my mentorship came in the form of that because there weren't a lot of people who were, there wasn't anybody who was saying, you know, I'm a costume designer, Ruth, and I'm going to take you under my wing and show you how to oh, do yeah. this. Yeah. You know, I came out of theater, so I already knew how to break down a script. I knew how to find, uh, I knew how to list the characters and do a little description of who they were and what their arc was. You know, I came out of theater, I knew that. But the film medium is uh, the one I had to discover through light, value, and understand composition. Nice, really nice. Ladies, gentlemen. Why don't we read a question from the... <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, so here's one from William. Uh, is it possible to be a fashion designer and a costume designer without impeding the growth of both professions. And I'll make it even more relevant regarding the continent where economics are such an issue. And well, to um, I think they're just, it's, it's a little bit apples and oranges because to be a good fashion designer, you have to study trends and you have to stay true to those trends in order to be a successful fashion designer, you have to sell. And sometimes that means going away from, maybe you have this love of, you know, elephants and you're going to do this line of clothes that's grays and, you know, elephant skin. But the trend right now is neon. So how do you become a fashion designer, a successful one, and ignore that the neon is what everybody wants to wear? How do you infuse your, ele your elephant idea with the neon? And so it takes you into another uh, kind of a business mo mode, as well as forces you to um, sort of take what's, what's coming, you know, because I do have forecasts, um, and take what's coming and infuse your ideas into it. Not everybody's going to be a trailblazer in fashion. And I think that's the misconception that we're all gonna be, you know, we're all gonna be the row. You know, we're all going to be able to do something that's unique. It's not, we're all going to be Marc Jacobs. Even Marc Jacobs has a line that he can't produce um, because of one reason or another. Mm -hmm. So fashion design creates a lot of challenges that's based on, you know, the economics of the time, what's happening in the social uh, uh, structure, what's, what's happening in the world. Costume design and fashion living together um, means that you're going to do, you can do both. Uh, you can infuse fashion into costume design. That's the beauty of costume design. And I think it's more, it's more likely that you can be, you can call yourself both by bringing fashion into costume design and maybe choosing to do more modern, modern shows that have more fashion in them and to get your name out there. Because you can design something original mm -hmm. character in, in, in costume design, where it's not always a success story when you put something original in the marketplace. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, ha said. you had a, you have a H&M line and yeah. part of, yes. Mm -hmm. It's not a line per se, but okay. everyone says, oh, you got a line with which H&M. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to do something for Black History Week, Black History mm -hmm. Month. And um, I really wanted to do like a real Black History line. Like I wanted to produce the blouse that Rosa Parks wore 
on the bus mm. and have a picture of her on the tag with a, her story on the back of the tag because it was nice. such a cute little top. And I was like, this thing will sell. And I wanted to have, you know, Malcolm X's hat and his glasses and his watch, you know, in the line. And there's a yeah. pic great picture of the three pieces. Put that on the tag. And they were like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is fast fashion. <laughs> right. I learned what fast fashion fast fashion was. So they were like, we like your logo. So I was like, okay, well, let me go back. And I came up with some croquis of ways to display my logo. Um, and then they wanted some slogans that would be inspiring to people. And so I was like, trust your voice. Because like mm. I said, this is not the Lion King. Yeah. I had to trust my voice and not listen to everybody else. And so that was big for me. And I felt like it was a really simple lesson that I could put out there for what Malcolm X did, what Martin Luther King did, you know, what I did, you know, what so many people have to do, what young people have to be told to do. So we put Trust Your Voice on a t-shirt and red, black, and green was my color palette because red is the blood we shed to get the uh -huh. green and our color is black. black. So I use red, the liberation colors right. as the, the line for Black History Month. Mm. Nice. And it's not very um, revealing in terms of females and bodies. I know that's an No, it's view. very unisex. I've gotten pictures from everyone wearing it. And it's really nice to see. Nice, nice. I would love for the three of you to get into some kind of specifics about the economics. And if you have particular challenges, Yolanda, Lahasa, and, and Ruth, if you have any suggestions or tips. I don't know how you all package it but I know economics are vastly different. I'm wondering if Ruth's experience can be of use in some tangible way to help that. Economics? Well, the cost of the, the budgets on the continent are, are a struggle, particularly if you look at on screen that people all around the world are watching everything. And some of it is at the scale that you're working, Ruth. So I wonder if there's a, a opportunity for you to help people on the continent to find more less expensive ways to accomplish great results oh i have to do that all the time i mean i feel <laughs> like i'm really good at that you know I, I i'm in a fitting and i'm like oh my god we're so out of stuff we don't have nothing left and i've still got 10 people to address um we did african dancers in uh coming to america that you know, the first coming to America, the dancers, when they came in, they looked very Brazilian, you know, it was very yeah. uh, un-African. So I was determined to make this new one uh, have some really good looking dancers in it. And then there were so many of them, I started running out of stuff. And so, you know, you know, just the, the ingenuity that I think, you know, it's on every level. It's not, it has nothing to do with economics. It really has to do with artistry. And you can take that curtain behind you and drape it on somebody and all of a sudden he's a noble king. So, <laughs> you know, just be, be creative. And that's what's going to, you know, get you through. Be creative and then have a good tailor or a seamstress who's going to come in behind you and say, now, what is this mess? How are you going to get out of it? But it, it does, it does really come down to that, like understanding drape, understanding your aesthetic, understanding your goals, and then being able to work with materials that you collect around you, you know, collect as much as you can. You're, you're collecting, you're not, you're not cherry picking. You are just gathering, 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 everything that you like, you know, everything that you like, and that will become your aesthetic. Mm. Yeah. Nice. I think I think for me and as as Rita said, like for me, I'm always chopping and cutting things. Uh, I will basically buy a dress, make turn it into a top, and then take the bottom of that dress, create a skirt out of it. So it's it's always finding innovative ways to always stretch a garment so that it's not just a garment that can do one job and you can always use it across the board. And it's always about knowing 
also like just it's always about like knowing the time that you are in and what and, and who you are addressing and what you want the person to look like and a lot of times i mean here in in in, in, in south africa like budget like every time when you start a project there's always we don't have budget but we want it to look like oh, yeah we want it to look like money and you always have to buy cheap stuff and then recreate them into looking like runway garments. And sometimes, in fact, all the time it has to work because you don't have any choice. It's just working with a good haberdashery and buying stuff that you can add on to garments and just take off stuff that you don't need from the garment and just make it look like it is money. And that's so much more creative than going and buying it. Because and that's the thrill. You have that's the thrill. ability to bring it all together, as opposed mm -hmm. to having product placement, donate yeah. this and donate that, and then you don't really have a story. You know, mm -hmm. when you're able to go to Target or go to you know Kmart or Walmart and sort of like, okay, let me figure out how I'm going to cut this up and make this what I need it to be. That's your design. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's much more re rewarding and fulfilling. Yeah, I, I, I always like those, especially when they bring somebody an hour before they have to be on set and okay. you are you just in the trailer and you just like, okay, now what do I put yeah. them in? And <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's what you can do in that pressure. It's amazing. <laughs> but then there's also the ego of the actors in that because not everybody understands that you don't have the budget not everybody understands that you had to um, mix and match you had to cut this up and then there's the ego so uh, managing the ego of the actor managing that situation there's a lot of psychology that just has to oh work. yeah mm -hmm. oh, I, I, think, I think costume designers are a, a, a low like key psychologist. oh yeah <laughs> I always tell my team like you just you're going to get a lot, you have to be able to take it all in. Yeah. And One you know, day, we'll be done. Yeah, and you know, you know, some, some of the actors, you know, hey, listen, you are actually not a PhD in psychology. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can't fix, you can't fix everything. No, no. <laughs> yeah, like walk away from the car, like walk away, like, you know, like say, you know, sometimes you have to throw in the towel and say, listen, producer, yeah. She wants that Prada dress, and I don't care yeah. <laughs> how many dresses I give her, she wants yeah. that Prada dress. Now, you talk to her about <laughs> what it means to wear what we need for her to wear. Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You get, every once in a while, you get one of them or him. It's not, it's not a gender yeah, thing. Yeah, it's not always, yeah. Mm -hmm. not yeah, always a gender thing. thing. Yeah. I had an actor who will be nameless uh, in his car riding to the set and I, I saw him going there you know like the dust coming from on, under the car getting to set and so i rushed to set to see why he's going there so early and he gets out the car and he walks to the director and he says you know these jeans don't fit mm -hmm. and i said to myself why did he get in the car drive all the way to the set huffing and puffing to go tell the director that these jeans don't fit. Is he trying to throw me under the bus or what? But I was standing there and I said, okay, we got three other sizes. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's the, what's so now what? Now what? Now what what's up? What's up? <laughs> I said, you want me to bring them here? And so you can change right here and decide which one you want. We can make the adjustment. You want me to bring right them here? here? Oh. No, I'll go back to my trailer. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I think I think I think a lot of times people don't know half of the stuff that we go through uh, as costume designers on set with 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 artists, and we always having to fix things. And uh, yeah, it's but at the end of the day, when they are watching and when they actually get to understand what we wanted to put them in 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 in, in those garments, they then get to understand that we were not. We were not trying to offend them in what we were trying to put them in, but we were trying to tell the story as authentic and as as real as we wanted it to 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 appear also on TV. Yes, yes, yes. It's difficult. It's difficult. I mean, and you're going to have some trial and some error, 
-hmm. you know that's the that's the growth process you know i have i can name a whole list of things that i would love to do over um knowing what i know mm -hmm. now right uh, but you know it just makes up your your body of work well our time is running out i get one more from each of you yolanda and lahasa and then we will be, okay uh, my last question be. would be in out in black panther mm -hmm. the women were perceived really strongly mm -hmm. how did that make you feel as a woman and it was so remarkable to see not a lot of skin showing but mm -hmm. then the Dora Milaje is sexy, mm -hmm. truly, like everybody. How did that make you feel? And let me just throw one in. What was your best costume you made in Black Panther? And what? In Black Panther. What was your best, your favorite costume that you oh, made? My favorite. Well, I have to say it was the Dora Milaje because the Dora represented so many areas of Africa. You know, it was mm -hmm. Himba, it was Maasai, it was, it was in the ballet, it was Zulu, it was everything. And um, I, I, I went about it in more of the traditional um, so that it looked like a samurai warrior costume. That's something I had this whole like spirit in myself that uh, I wanted it to be perceived as something that uh, Dora could take and pass on to her daughter that she might train to be a Dora Milaje. I wanted the, the, the the uniform to feel that substantial you know and that powerful that it's something that the harness could be you know uh enshrined um if uh, dora was to perish you know in battle so i had the the leather work done as i said in the south african style i had the the bead work done very much like the tricana i had the back skirt i had the edge of the back skirt the back stretched, back. Soaked, soaked and stretched soaked. like the himbo women uh did when they uh, soaked and stretched the hides and it would look like ruffling you know a ruffling along the edges and so there was so much of that technique that was infused in that um, costume. I also love the Dogon too, but we don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> the first part of your question was, what again? How uh, women are perceived strongly. Oh, yes. Life. Okay, so I'll tell you a quick story. Um, you know, I had never done a Marvel film before, so... You know, I was I was nervous. You know, every time I went into the into Marvel, it's like walking into the CIA. You know, I was like, oh my god, you know, your eyes, <laughs> and, and you know, so I was like nervous about you know, like who am I? You know, who am I to tell the 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 Oz? You know, the all powerful Oz? You know, Oz. <laughs> and so I uh, I uh, I had a safety zone and in Ryan Coogler. And so my question was, you know, are the Dora Milaje like they look in the comics? And so the, the Marvel visual development team had been doing lots of illustrations before I even started of the Dora Milaje. And so, you know, he had already set in his mind that he wanted them in uniform and he wanted them to be taken seriously. And he wanted them also to be beautiful and bald. And so I came in and I was like, you know, curious of, you know, how these guys were going to perceive the Dora Milaje. Because in the comic books, they're like bombastic, you know, they're like in bikini tops and, you know, <laughs> kicking ass, you know. But he said, I don't want that. I want them to have a split toe boot and flat on the, flat on the ground. You know, I want them in uniform because they're protecting the king. You know, I want them to be taken seriously. So mm -hmm. in that concept of fully covered, that's when we started to craft the uniform that they eventually wore, that the harness that travels around the body. I have a beautiful picture of it. Um, the harness that travels around the body, you know, it was important for it to you know, really highlight the beauty of the female form. Mm. And uh, I'm going to share my screen with you. Here it is. Okay. Do you see it? Yes. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yes. So it was really important that it, oops, that it, um, 
it uh, travel around the body and and really highlight you know the bust and the waist and the hips so that it would you know be uh, a really beautiful beautiful garment I'd like to assume these are going to end up in museums if they're not already. Well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. They are that impactful, as you well know. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Lahatsa? I mean, for me, just, just, to, just to round off the, the conversation, I know that you are also a part of, uh, you're actually the governor. Um, of the costume branch of the academy now. And I just wanted to know what, because we, we, you, you kind of touched on, 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 the, on, on the issue of, of, of the past and what was happening. So what, 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 what are you looking to, 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 to do differently uh, with, with, the, with the new given position? Well, when I, I've, been a gov I've been in the academy since I was 30. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time that I'm not scared of like my my voice mm -hmm. it that way um, because this structure was really kind of built on a Hollywood uh, aesthetic. This institution um, mm -hmm. before me, there were there were people in blackface, you know. Uh, with the white woman running scared, and there were there were Indians, Indians, and they were you know Latinos with red face. There were so many. Uh, their, their foundation was built on you know some beautiful things, you know Audrey mm -hmm. Hepburn, but also some awful infractions to race and our contribution to Hollywood. So mm. I'm proud to say that I am the change that I want to see by mm. being a governor. And also that they are very much interested in not only telling that sordid history, because it is the history you know, of Hollywood and Hollywood mm. filmmaking to just really show this this big, huge nugget of where, where we've come from and what we're doing now and that we can, you know, have a film like Parasite, you know, win Best Foreign right. and Best Picture. You know, we can have a Black Panther make $1.3 billion worldwide and break records. So I'm proud to say that I am the change that I want to see, but as that a person of change, I have to do, I feel like more to <laughs> bring in the aesthetic to, to see more of the things that we want to see, to help everybody in there understand like what makes some of the films that we love important to us, to help guide that retraining re of the eye because it was built on something that was just very uh, puritanical, very colonizer-like, and now it has flourished. And so the body of the academy, in terms of its communicating out to the world, is interested in showing that you know we have a collective voice that is inclusion, including inclusionary. So, you know, I'm having a, a lot of, of, of fun, actually. We have a museum that's coming up in April of next year, and I'm on different boards to make sure that it's balanced with the different cultural uh, pieces and elements, and so. Well, we love yeah. that. Well, thank uh, you. Congratulations once again on we are so the new glad. collection. Thank mm. you. Been fun we are so glad to have you, um, Lights, Camera, Diaspora, uh, Lorna K. Johnson, co-founder, Mona Lisa Wokike, producer, and myself are honored to have you and have, uh, I've had a professional crush on you for 30 years, so oh, <laughs> super glad. So close, all I'm these here years. To tell you, 
Uh, you asked me if I, if I had a wedding ring on something and somebody needed a ring and you asked. I don't think you used it, but I was like, Ruth, talk to me. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me, uh, let me get that ring. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, well, you, know, and, you've had, you had some great questions over here from people, and I wonder how oh, if you've I got time. Hey, those. now you know. You give us an idea of your time, and we absolutely can do anything you want. I mean, if, it's, uh, if you have a website, I don't mind, like, answering these questions, and you can Indeed. post them. Um, because the some of them really... You want to pick a few uh, now? Do it, whatever you like, and we can okay. post the rest after. Um, okay, April Hickman. She says, this is a kind of a selfish question. I'm a recent MFA grad from Yale School of Drama. The current climate has me very concerned for the future of theater and film. I'm interested in designing for film and theater. Do you have any advice for a designer heading into the costume world in this climate? Or advice on where to go next? Also, thank you for putting all, thank you all for putting this together. I'm very excited to be here and glad to have this moment with all with you all. Um, uh, you know, it's really hard. Everybody's trying to predict what to do in this climate. Um, I'm taking the time to actually do something outside of my costuming because I can't do costuming. So I'm painting. I'm writing. I'm you know, developing things that are creative that I can do on my own. Um, it, I, I believe in my soul that we cannot thrive without going to the theater, that we cannot thrive without going to the movie. So that is not going to go away. But however, you have an opportunity right now to grow. So take this opportunity to dig deep within yourself and figure out what it is that you need to uh, get stronger at. And there's a whole world out there on the internet that will allow you to take a class. People are even offering free classes because of the COVID uh, quarantine. So I just think that you should start, you know, what they say, jazz musicians, they call it going in the woodshed. I think mm, yes. you should go into your woodshed and just started honing your craft. When we emerge, you'll be so much ready. It's, and sometimes you're ready for the project you didn't realize that you were going to be, you were making yourself ready for. Nice. And your painting in, informs your color choice. in Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's great. Uh, Yvonne Johnson asks, uh, do you... Do you do your own rendering or did you in the past? What I used to, say? yeah, I used to do my own renderings, but it takes me too long. <laughs> and do you sketch now? now you got a, I do do a rough sketch for the illustrators. So when we're communicating, I'm doing a rough sketch, you know, and then they get it, um, you know, because everything is so subjective. You can talk about something and somebody's receiving it in a whole nother way. So unless mm -hmm. you have mood boards, Sometimes I do a rough sketch based on what we see in the mood boards, but it's nothing fancy. But for I'm Gonna Get You Sucker, I did illustrations for Do the Right Thing. I did illustrations school days. I did illustrations. Um, I said, I'm gonna get you sucker. I did illustrations. Then I stopped doing them because I didn't have time, but I could collage. I still collage. And now I collage digitally. Uh, I use a program in design. I love in design. Um, PowerPoint is good, but I think InDesign is po more powerful. You can actually, you know, zoom into something a lot, e a lot better, a lot sharper. So I use Photoshop and InDesign uh, in collaboration sometimes. But if I'm doing like a lecture or whatever, like that image I just showed you was yeah. from one of my lectures. Mm. Nice. Uh, upcoming projects? I just finished Coming to America 2. And... Um, I'm starting Black Panther 2 in September. Nice. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about uh, someone, uh, Deborah Ray Sims, have you written a book focusing the, on the process and journey of Black diaspora film costume designer? Uh, I'm, yeah, go ahead. That, we would love to see a book from you. I am in the, I have a publishing deal. I'm working on a book, coffee table book. 
and it'll have 10 images from 10 of my films with illustrations and I just talk about my journey on those films. I, I really want to make it not just a, a book of stills that the still photographer mm -hmm. took. I'm going to put some of my illustrations in there, some of, you know, the dynamic ones. I'll show you some from Black Panther that were um, like illustrators that just work on computer um, that do amazing work. Um, uh, here's one. Um, let's see. There we go. You see it? Yes. Yeah, I can't see what you see. That's the weird thing. That's beautiful. But, yeah, so they do all that on computer, and you notice she's in the same pose, um, mm -hmm. but her costume is completely different. That helps us work really fast. Um, here's another one. You know, this is the Royal Guard. These are some of the uh, illustrations that we submitted for Royal Guards. And then this one in blue is Wakabe, the leader of the border tribe. They police the border around Wakanda. Yes. Uh, and this one is the Artisan tribe. This shows you how they have a tribal leader and also how we see modern ideas that really are based on their tribal, their tribal base and their tribal culture. It has a little Turkana in there. There's a, there's a mm -hmm. few projects mixed in there. And then there's a few modern, uh, modern looks. Uh, the same with this one. These are the miners. And all of these are done on computer. They're standing there. This guy, he's, he's drawing on a little tablet and he's just drawn away. I, I this I'd be still making this drawing if it right. was had to do it. <laughs> but uh, you see, we just we uh, we studied. Uh, this was one of our maps of Wakanda. We studied the map, and we had different districts. That was all worked out before I started, and then we you know, looked at, uh, you know, the elements of different uh, tribes. I uh, like this one was uh, based can, on the Lesotho. Can Lusutu. you hold there for one second? Lahasa, this is the wound kind of region of what we were talking about yesterday, yeah? Uh, no, no, no. So, no, the, so this, yeah, Give Ruth a bit of background on that, if you would. So, because this, this is the Basotho, um, this is the Basotho, this is actually in Lesotho. And uh, with the wound, it, it was based in the Eastern Cape. So it's mm -hmm. in the Eastern side of South Africa. And uh, they also use, uh, when, when, when uh, boys uh, become into men, when, when, when the journey into becoming men, uh, mm -hmm. they also go to the mountains and they also wear blankets um, throughout the, the, the process. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like, I think a lot of times in, 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 in a lot of, in fact, in a few, in a few, in, in a few of our, um, our, um, our cultures, uh, blankets play, play a very huge role in, 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 in saying what the person is becoming or who the person is. Mm. Oh, yes, wonderful. And also, I know that these blankets were a gift um, from a European uh, uh, prince that came into Lesotho and gave them and the king uh, really loved them so much. He incorporated them into the culture many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, they wear these also these like heart shaped hats with the, like the opening has this little heart shape. And Ryan uh, Kugler went uh, and stayed, spent some time here. This is like one of the regions that still does uh, have a lot of tradition um, in their culture and He's, he stayed with them for some time and fell in love with the blankets and said to me, you know, Ruth, you have to get these blankets and they are going to be shields for the border tribe. So uh, there's really one uh, company that makes them, I think it's called Aranda. Right, and, um. mm -hmm, and so I imported like 200 of these blankets and we had to stamp vibranium on one side. I guess everybody knows what vibranium is and what it isn't. Um, mm -hmm. And we put the vibranium on, side, on one side and, and Ryan felt like it looked too, um, too thick. 
And so we had to shave these blank 200 blankets down with a, ra a men's uh, razor, uh, which took forever. And then we sent him this like video of the guy uh, in it. Does this video one too? There it is. So, so he could see how, you know, this is in the beginning stages of coming up with the costume, how the blanket yeah. could actually, you know, move. The movement. Mm. Yeah. So, how many of these fittings did you have, if, 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 if I may ask, actually, um, on, in the costumes? I couldn't count them. There were several. <laughs> I mean, because we had uh, people coming in to, um, as fo as a uh, um, fit doubles, you know, so we mm -hmm. would get someone in Lupita's likeness. Now you see, this is the original sketch that I had um, from Marvel, but there's a lot of dark areas here, and she's much taller than the real Lupita. Um, and this harness uh, is way above her bust, you know. So there were elements of this that I felt like I needed to craft differently. Um, mm -hmm. And so I turned her around and had my illustrator kind of readjust this design to make it more attractive to the female form. So I lowered the harness here and I changed the direction of the, the lines and the tights so that she, her legs would elongate and lowered the ring so that it wasn't at the widest part of her of her leg mm. and so this way i could see how you know everything lays out and like you have a choice here what to do with the necklace you have a choice whether you want it to be uh beads you know sewn into the costume and we decided to make the armor like jewelry so this was you know, plated with a high sheen, and this was created like um, a necklace in the end. But you can see here where we do a vacuum form, we have the actress actually stand in a, uh, a chamber and her body is scanned, and then we make a mannequin of her form and, um, and create the costume on that form that best enhances her beauty. And so you can see, I'm going to go to Lupita. You can see how that, um, how that plays out. Do I have her in this one? I don't think so. Uh, I'm not sure. But yeah, it just, it was just all about that, you know. Well, we, oh, I also 3D printed a lot of pieces and this is our computer illustrations of, you know, what the Ishikolo would look like and I wanted to stay true to the actual lines of the hat um, that's woven um, and not create something different but have it have it printed in a computer and so Ramonda's uh, Ishikolo was uh, and her shoulder mantle also was uh, 3d 3d printed Th this is the pieces that it that the colors represent the different pieces that mm. came out of the computer and um, and then this is how it we put we put those pieces together, glued them together, and then we kind of sprayed in this this pearlescence into it. And that house that hat is uh, the crown headpiece is South African. Is that correct? Yes, South yes. African married woman's hat. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Las Lahasa. Oh yes, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's, it's color. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's from uh, the Zulu tribe. And yes, it is a very significant um, a part in, in, in that culture. When a woman gets married, uh, she needs to be presented, she's going to be presented with a isitolo. And um, on the wedding day, it actually has beads in front that serves as a veil. And, wow. uh, and then it gets removed um, after, after, after all the proceedings have, have been done. So yeah, it, it it was always great. Like it's, it, it was so great how it was it it, it was still Isikolo, but you could see that a, a min, 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 like minor um, details were, were were switched, but you could still see how you kept you, you kept the authenticity of, mm -hmm. of of the head intact, and that I think it was more. I think this was something that people appreciated because it also started a whole culture 
of um of us at South Africans also like starting to appreciate what we have and everybody that went to go see the film where like wore an African attire to go actually watch the the yeah. the, the, the movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And of course across America, many, many people who would never have dreamed of wearing African attire uh did so mm-hmm. in uh, in large part. Um uh, uh, Ryan, of course, is the visionary in the project, but also Ruth as well. Um, I think for the average uh, person, Ruth is equally as important in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, you know, I was given the panther suit. Um, I was given the panther suit pretty much like this. Um, you know, the panther suit has been in the comics, you know, forever. This is the suit, and there are minor details that modernize it. But there was a texture on it that basically was done by computer. And I kind of felt like, you know, how do I create this panther suit and, and connect him to everything else that we were doing that connected, you know, the technology to Africa. And so what we ended up doing was coming up with this texture that was the triangle. And like when you look throughout Uh, the continent and a lot of the artistry, the triangle is part of like a sacred geometry. You see the triangle a lot and it does refer to the father, the mother and the child. And, Mm. and we called it the Ishikolo, not the Ishikolo, I'm sorry, the Okavango triangle. And, uh, you know, for the Okavango River and the artistry that we had uh, witnessed that came from different regions and different communities that were doing carvings and things along the Okavango River. So we called it the Okavango Triangle and we put it all over the suit. This was the texture of the suit. And so it really had a beautiful meaning for, for me to have contributed to the history of this suit now to, you know, include this, this texture. Nice. Uh, well, Garland Thompson would, would said that uh, he would love a book by you along with several other people in the comments, but he also was asking, would you ever do theater again? Or do you do any more theater? I do, but um, theater uh, is a medium where they uh, need to book you like months yeah. in advance. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> And so it's hard for me to say, yeah, I'll do the play in January 2021 when I don't know if I'll be on Black Panther or not. So I have done some, you know, quick, quick stuff. You know, I did A Raisin in the Sun at the Kirk Douglas Theater here and Felicia Rashad directed it. So I still love going back to theater. They don't have the budgets and a lot of the places I go to to rent things don't want to bring to theater pieces. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we didn't want to take you away from your presentation okay. or Thank your questions, but I know time yeah. is officially over, so you let us know. Okay. Thank you, know. you. I'm I'm good. Okay. Fine. Good. All right. I I guess I had also oh, there was also one question I think like um I I just wanted uh, you to answer because somebody wrote that um the um uh, would you release a coloring book and I know that you do have a coloring book. Yes, we're going to release the coloring book at the Academy Museum. It's going to be for sale in the store, and then I'm going to have it for sale online. So I just did a sampling. It wasn't really like all of the wonderful line drawings that I wanted to have in it, but it was like uh, some of the modern things that I had done that weren't really related to any actor or film. So we released those on Instagram, you know, coloring up. And that was fun. But now I really always wanted to, I loved to color when I was a kid. So I love, re, you know, in, introducing coloring to, you know, families that can share this during like this quarantine. Wow. Well, thank you very much. Welcome. It has been a pleasure. We could do this for another bunch of weeks. It yeah, seems yeah. there's so much accomplishment and information and uh, uh, sharing and caring coming from your work and from you. Thank you. Yeah. 
you guys, good luck to you. And, uh, you know, I, I buy your questions. I really appreciate these like wonderful, smart, well thought out questions that you, uh, you gave me. It made it a lot fun for me. It wasn't the norm that I always get. So I appreciate you doing the research on my background. I was surprised, you know, I was from Massachusetts. So I appreciate all that you've done and good luck to you as designers. I, I feel like you are, you're confident and you're on your path. So I look to see your work um, out there in film, television, theater, wherever you should land. Thank you. Thank <laughs> and for our attendees, where can they follow you in social media? I'm uh, the real Ruthie Carter is on Instagram. Uh, my Facebook got hacked, so I don't have a Facebook right now. But uh, I'm on there, Ruth Costume Design, on uh, Facebook as well. Or you can like go to my website, RuthieCarter.com, and I do have a blog that I haven't been paying attention to. But this is a good time to sort of add more to the blog. But there's enough there for you to see. So RuthieCarter.com. Thank you. Um, Lahasa, Yolanda, we're going to wrap up. We, uh, Lights, Camera, Diaspora will stay on for a bit after for any of the Thanks. attendees who want to talk, but officially, um, you guys, Lahasa, your Instagram? Um, I am La, um, Lahasa to Lahasa, the number two, uh, on Instagram. And I've just started a web page called Hasa and then style and then sale. So it's H-A-S-A, -S -A, um, style and then S-E-O um, on Instagram. And yeah, that's where you could see my work. Excellent. Uh, Yolanda? Uh, on Twitter, that's Yolanda R. Okereke. On Instagram, I'm not sure if my Instagram account is hacked, if it's disabled, if it's locked, if they lock me out. But that's at Yolanda Okereke. That's where it has all of my work. Or you can just go hashtag Yolanda Okereke or hashtag the Rani company. Something will come up. Rani is R-A-N-I, right? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, Mona Lisa, thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Uh, oh, thank you. Now, Yolanda and Lahasa, we will hang out here ourselves. You're welcome to stay on for a minute if you care to. Um, yeah, I don't mind you. staying on. Okay. I mean, somebody just said they loved the costume on Queen Sona. Yes. The work on Queen Sona. Yeah. Thank you so much. Can we talk about that, the show that you have on? Oh, this. Oh, yes. so so it's, so so we we in winter and it's actually quite freezing and I didn't want to wear a heavy jacket for <laughs> for the for the meeting so I it's this is actually a, a throw that I normally use as a as a scarf so I use as a shawl so yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, before we get there hold on before we get there so um, just as in terms of sign off uh, mm -hmm. our attendees who are still on. Uh, can follow us at lightscameradiaspora.org on our website. And our Instagram is lightscameradiaspora.com and you, uh, lightscameradiaspora. And you can actually go there and support us uh, as a not-for-profit. It's always great to be supported from our community. And uh, we are looking forward to doing more of these. We don't have the next one lined up, but we will be sure to email everyone who has attended previous ones. Uh, we generally do them every Wednesday or every other Wednesday, uh, same time. And for that, we thank all of you. All right. Uh, uh, I think Lana, we should bring Lana on. Lana, you coming on? Ask her. Uh, yes, I'm gonna move her. So, Yolanda, what are you working on? Now? Yes, now. <laughs> Answering the question in the Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> you saw my serious face, right? Yes. Yes, someone was asking about um, um, collaboration. So mm. I'm sending privately my email. Okay, excellent. I don't get a lot of spam. No, I'm excellent. popular now. 
I know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Now Mickey Dubé is on. Hey, Lorna K. Johnson. Hey, Christian and Mona. Oh, Mickey Dubé here. Yeah. Uh, this is Yolanda and Lahasa. This is Lorna K. Johnson. She's the co-founder. Uh, Hi there. Camera Diaspora. Hi. Hello. And uh, though that's Lahasa and it's Yolanda. It's so hard to hear there. you. You're speaking really low. Oh, me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So welcome, Lorna. Thanks. <laughs> I know, that was great, you know, as an observer uh, who kind of uh, dances in this world. I just thought, you know, what the two of you bought with uh, Miss Carter, it was, it was just a wonderful story on everybody's process. Because so many of us who are observers of the product don't really know and appreciate the, the, the process. So I thought all three of you shared with that. I've been to both of the countries. I work heavily uh, in South Africa and I've been to Nigeria uh, several times. So I understand, you know, the difference, but I just thought both of you really just gave that, uh, that insight that those of us who love films from um, Mother Africa can also appreciate as well. Thank you so much. Pleasure, thank you. Yeah, it's a lot of work. I wouldn't, I wouldn't lie. <laughs> it's a movie on its own. It's a movie on its own because <clears throat> there's the, I call it blood, sweat and tears. Yeah, because yeah. sometimes you have this amazing costume, you've done it, oh, it's so beautiful. You go fitting and it's not what you imagined. You literally right. have to start all over again. Or you're on set and the costume gets ripped and there might not be a double because of the budget. So there's so many things can go right and so many things can go wrong. So it's, at, when you see it on big screen, then you just be like, oh, wow, is that it? Okay. It's a journey. Excellent. Um, anything in the Q&A left that you guys want to address? Mm -hmm. And anybody as an attendee wish to come on live on video and... and Raise your hands and I will mm -hmm. add and I'll bring you up. Yeah, got something You know who has never come on? Who? Is Sue Ellen. I'm gonna bring her up because she <laughs> is... <on the> <laughs> Ask her, she may not <laughs> turn in. But I'm gonna do it anyway. You can oh, go yeah. ahead and let mine. But I'll bring her up anyways. Hi, Sue Ellen. <laughs> She's like, what? Wait a minute. I'm, I'm at the she club. Put on her face. <laughs> yes, even healthy and out and about. Nice. We can't hear you. You're mute. Oh, let me unmute you. Go ahead. Okay. I'm taking my morning constitutional, so I don't know if I can contribute to this conversation because it's really loud where I am. No, it's fine. We hear you fine. <laughs> We Thank you, you for having this platform. I feel like I'm on the. <laughs> Mona Lisa just brought you on. So. I know. I'm like, <laughs> she just put me on the spot. Yes, that's right. I'm sorry, say that again? You work for Marvel, right? You used to work for Marvel, right? Yeah, in post production, not in costume. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. worked as a post production coordinator. Which means you work with costumes as well, by <laughs> default, in a roundabout way. Yes, but uh, not in the actual department, but Correct. I supported them, yeah. And you manage their images and their content and their quality, yes. Um, and so, Sue Ellen, you're from Zim officially, um, but you're based here for many years. Uh, in terms of like, costumes and, and Zim. I know that they're working obviously with less resources than Ruth or from SA and probably Nigeria, but do you, do you see any progress or result from whatever connection is there in terms of the industry? And in particular, Black Panther, did it have an impact on the community there? In Zimbabwe? Yes. Um, that's a good question. I, 
to be honest, I've never really observed because I don't spend a lot of time there except for right. when I go visit family. Right. But uh, I do know that when the film came out, it did make an impact in the community in general. People were excited to see people that looked like them projected on screen on, in a blockbuster film that we don't often to get see on screen. So in that aspect, yes, it did make a difference. Nice. Um, Lahasa Yolanda, I see the people, uh, Yolanda, I think Yolanda put her info in the chat. Lahasa, you should type it into the chat as well, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. Let me do and so. Martha, I have a question for you. Um, I know back in the day when I started in Nollywood, um, we used to make actors bring their own clothes. Do you still do that or do you not do that anymore? Budget, budget, budget. <laughs> um, it's <laughs> not... <laughs> I, 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 not something I agree to. So most of the time I fight it. And I would say over the years doing this for, I've been doing this for um, in 2020, over 10 years now, I've been able to build a wardrobe. So oh. I do oh. my stuff. That you Safer. own. Nice. Yeah, that I own, that I know would fit. So I still leave it open for production to say, bring your stuff. Because I watch and I, I know when they have won that costume, they don't get paid much. So you, you wouldn't expect to get paid small money and they invested in the wardrobe for your film that's paying them little or nothing. So I tell mm. them, bring your stuff, but we have our stuff. So mm. we complement it or we, if it works 100%, yeah, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And then it takes away from the character. Then yeah. we should just put a live camera everywhere and everybody just act. Mm. Yes, it's not um, something I had. Mm. Mona Lisa, see if you can bring Ralston Smith on. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Ralston Smith. Ross? Ralston, R-A-L-S-T-O-N. All right, he's on. Hey, Chris, I'd like to add something. I'm going to yes. have to go. One of the things I noticed about this conversation that came really mm -hmm. clear to me, um, very familiar with Spike's work. Uh, of course, I'm familiar with your work, is that for people, um, and all three of you obviously have been to the continent, but it was really clear with Ruth Carter uh, that even though she did not go to the continent till after um, she did Black Panther, and I kind of got a sense that was her first time, that I saw a string among those of you whose work I'm familiar with, with such a really deep love of Black people and how that manifests mm -hmm. in the work, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I was unaware, I'm sure I saw it. I was one of part of that generation. Some of you young folks may know, we were asked to take off when Malcolm X came out, you know? And I was part of that group that took off for a day and that was a big, big thing. And I remember seeing that film, what, over 20 some years ago and just being so moved by, as she said, the beauty of how the nation of Islam, you know, how Angela yeah. was portrayed. And I keep seeing that, you know, through the work. I mean, I talk to Christians sometimes in my newly developed knowledge about lighting. Well, did you think about that when you were lighting? But I think a lot of that artisticness that comes that from what I saw with Ruth Carter and what I know about Christian, and of course I know about Spike, really comes from a deep, deep love of Black people. And when you love yeah. Black people in that way, your artistry shows up in, in a different, yes. in a much different way. So it oh. was just really a, a confirming, a confirmation for me in just hearing her speak uh, without having, quote unquote, touched the ground to be able to translate that through all the films that she's done, whether it was Black Panther or whether it was Malcolm X many years ago. It was just that love. And, and your voice is, is much different. Yeah. If you love me, you'll take good care of my image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it's very, that, that part of it is very simple. Now we're seeing the effect now that more black people all around the globe are in leadership positions in these various departments, you know? All right. Yeah. Thank yeah. You guys. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, who, anybody else on that wants to come on? Anybody else raise your hand? 
Did Mickey do? So Ralston went away. I guess that means he didn't want to. Or uh, Lahasa, if you guys recognize anybody yeah. that you want us to bring on, I can go ahead and mm -hmm. bring them. On. Okay. Okay, let me check. Yeah. Let me just... So yeah, so another funny, so if, if, if there's still people on, um, so me and Yolanda uh, worked on a similar project. She worked on a Nigerian leg of it. I worked on the South African leg of the, um, uh, the project. Uh, MTV Sugar, it is. And yeah, yeah and we, it was just amazing that we have worked on, 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 this, on, on the same show. We've never known each other. And then, and then along comes Christian and... Uh, reunites us <laughs> <laughs> and yeah and it's it's and this platform has actually also like just helped both of us to now create other relationships like work relationships that mm -hmm. can be beneficial for for both so that was that that was great so i have a question about that um lahasa so uh mm -hmm. with sono they shot all over they didn't just shoot in essay they shot in they shot in nigeria as well right so how do you work with the continuity? Did you do the costume for that leg of it or did somebody else take over and were you involved in that since you were the lead starting? What, so what I... Queen Sona. So, oh, so okay. I, so I style, so I, I, I did costume for everything, for all the legs. Um, and then they had somebody doing the, um, Tanzania, uh, ta um, the Tanzania one, uh, Zanzibar. They had uh, a different person doing that, but uh, basically the costume was was already set, and we had already established uh, key uh, costumes uh, for the show, and it was just it was just them basically making sure that the the, ex the extras and the actors are in the correct costumes when they were traveling. But yeah, it was just for, for the Zanzibar uh, leg of it. But for the rest of them, we were hands on. Right on. What else? Yolan, you have? You, anybody else? Anybody else want to come yeah. on? Anybody want to? Okay. See. You've all run away. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Should we wrap up or you want to look over it first? We're in, I'm in no rush, but in. if anybody wants to come on, they can raise their hands as well. Suellen is out of here. So, okay. Very good. And also, I think I just want to just thank um, everybody for creating this platform. I mean, it was very insightful and very um, and very inspiring also, because as, 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 as um, Ms. Carter was speaking, I kind of realized that as costume designers, we all go through the same struggles and we have the same challenges, either be um, the budget, the politics on set, or... Right. anything we all have the same issues and what the people see from outside they always see the perfect story that people look beautiful and they never know the drama that happens behind it and kudos to all the costume people the makeup artists and everybody who's the, the crew the crew and cast on set that just always make sure that the pro the, the project um goes on and it comes to life I mean, it does take a lot of strength to make it through the end, but yeah, we yeah. All make it through. So, yeah, kudos to everybody. Nice. Yeah. Um, okay, so one more before you go, if you would, I just want to get a little still of you looking at the camera and smiling. Um, so, <laughs> I know. hold on, hold on, hold on, because I'm realizing we. We need thumbnails, and I'm realizing, oh, some of the thumbnails, people's mouths are open and, you know, looking crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank uh, you so much. 
Adrian. Mm-hmm. I really do. Thank you, everybody. Really what you did with this platform. It was like I spoke through you to the universe and you yes. made it happen. Yeah. Oh, you know, when we said that we were going to do this, the first person that talked about you was Mildred. Mildred was like, Yolanda. And I was like, <laughs> he's already thinking of Yolanda. I think that's who he wants to do it with. But Mildred is yeah. my cousin. But she was like, yes, Yolanda. Yeah, she, she, told, she told me that yesterday. So he, I, I think I, I, I bumped Crystal on set a couple of times. Like, oh, I want to meet this person. Like, the only reason I'll get on a plane to go to America is if we want to see Ricardo. So, so I wake up one morning and he's like, eh, it's happening. I'm like, what's happening? It's like, eh, on a panel. I'm like, ha, I'm on a panel. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's one of the things and I will cherish in my lifetime. Thank you so much. It was so insightful. Wasn't expected. It's not my birthday, but this is my birthday gift. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. I now have met the Hassa, so I have an alliance in SA. That's great. I know Mona Lisa. She's connected to Mildred. That's one of my mentors. So <laughs> it's just a big circle. And thank you all yes. for being in the circle with me. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. It's so easy, easy to work with. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, good people. You all have a great rest of your evening. Um, no and you have a great start to your day. I mean, Thank I guess you. already started. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you guys are uh, over with the starting now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, be in touch, you know. I, who knows what's next? Um, Queen Sono season two uh, is in the, in the, what do you call it? I don't know. Lined up in the works, God willing, and the creek don't rise. Um, And uh, Yolanda knows I'm a a, Mm -hmm. a self-proclaimed Nigerian, so I'll be back (laughs) regardless. Um, Whenever we finish that thing or whatever else comes along. In Nigerian Um, name. Yes. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I think think it's Adebowale. Is what some people have decided. No, so that's your I'm Igbo, so I'm giving you an Igbo oh, name. Right. He goes to Igbo land, he wants them to give him a name, and then when he leaves, he wants them to I didn't yeah. go so to them. You, you take Chinedu, Iketruku, there's a range. I'll uh-huh. send you 10. Pick one. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, um, all right. All right. Y'all have a good night. Lahasa, right. I will hit you up. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ciao. Right, bye. Okay, bye.